you can see the dates here for Jeremy Bentham. And one thing to note about that is he is a predecessor to John Stuart Mill, uh, his more famous uh, defender of utilitarianism. But certainly Mill got a lot of his ideas from Bentham. Now, of course, hedonism it goes back all the way to the ancient Greeks. Now, I'm sure you are looking at that photo. It is actually the skeleton of Bentham. And it is his will, he said that it should be housed at the University College in London. For uh, over 150 years, it was in the main building there in, in kind of a wardrobe-like structure. But recently, they moved it to the student center. And that's actually his skeleton. There is a obviously wax uh, figure there of his head so that he is memorialized there at University College. But let's go ahead and look at his main idea of utilitarianism. Of course, utilitarianism is based on pain and pleasure. So we want to look at that first, and we're going to cover that in two slides. Well, pain and pleasure, uh, Bentham says, drive humans in two ways. First of all, as instruments for action, they motivate what we do. And also, they are the things that determine value for humans. And so first, let's look at this idea that the, the pain and pleasure drives us. This is, of course, by cause and effect. So we are motivated to pursue pleasure. We are motivated to avoid pain, and that causes our actions. And pain and pleasure, says Bentham, governs all of our activities. And so the attempts to avoid pain and experience pleasure, cause our actions, and that happens whether we want them to or not. And we can define good and bad by the degree that pain or pleasure is promoted or by the degree that it is decreased. So we are subject to these desires for pleasure and the desire to avoid pain. So an example that I use is a student who shows up in class in the middle of the semester. And of course, uh, they want to be there to hear the lecture. But when you push some of the students, they are motivated by more practical desires to learn the material. Why is that? So that they can do well at, on the exam. Why do they want to do that? So that they can pass the course or get a good grade in the course? Why do they want to do that to get the degree or continue to have their scholarship? Now, why do they want to have the degree to have a better job than they could without the degree and to be able to take care of themselves, to buy the things that they need that would give them pleasure? And especially, hopefully, they will get a job that they enjoy and also be able to afford things that they enjoy, not only have food and shelter, but food that they enjoy and shelter that they can appreciate, things like that. So ultimately, they are seemingly motivated by pleasure and the avoidance of pain. So there's a lot of merit to this idea. Now, let's continue to think about this, though, when we transfer that idea and talk about right or wrong. So Bentham says that pain and pleasure are directly related to the concepts of right and wrong. And so the principle of utility, thus the name utilitarianism, the principle of utility approves or disapproves every action that one makes according to the tendency that it has, or at least appears to have, in promoting uh, or decreasing our happiness. And again, happiness is pleasure and a lack of pain. So a good action is one that promotes utility. And of course, utility is happiness or pleasure. And let's expand on that just a little bit. So utility is the property of producing benefit. Things that have utility are things that produce benefit. Well, when we're talking about humans, what are we talking about? That's what gives us an advantage or gives us pleasure. 
And that's the same as the good or happiness, according to Bentham. These are all synonyms. And of course, on the flip side, that is true. And the, the negative term, so utility is the property of preventing mischief and pain and evil and unhappiness, which are also then, according to Bentham, synonyms. These all mean the same thing. So pain and evil is the same as unhappiness. And of course, unhappiness is the experience of pain. And this principle of utility can be applied for individuals making moral decisions on one's own and also for governing bodies when you have to make decisions about what kinds of things uh, we are going to enact in public policy and so on. So let's uh, think about utilitarianism uh, a little more. Utilitarianism takes these truths that we just considered about pleasure and pain, both their cause and effect interactions, and the idea that they are the means of evaluating morality. And so we use this as a basis for morality. And that means that what ought to be done, what should be done, what morally you are obligated to do is going to be the same as what is a right action, which is the same as an action that produces utility. And so you get, according to Bentham, from these facts of the matter to what ought to be the case. And I'm not going to criticize that at this moment. So what is the argument? Can you argue for utilitarianism? Well, Bentham states that the principle is one that you cannot argue for. You cannot prove it. Why? Because it's a first principle. It's a principle that can be used to prove other things, but itself cannot be supported by an argument. Now, it's simple, similar then, what we're talking about, is to the principle of non-contradiction. You can't prove the principle of non-contradiction because you need it in order to construct an argument to begin with. So uh, again, the idea of principle of non-contradiction, sorry, uh, for those, of course, who are very familiar with this, but it's the idea that you cannot both affirm and deny the same proposition when the words have the same meaning. And that's a fundamental principle of rationality. So there is no basis to argue for it because you need it in order to construct arguments. So Bentham says, when we're talking about morality, you have to use the principle to make any sense out of morality. So you can't argue for it. Now, Later on, Mill does make an attempt to provide an argument for it. Now, uh, we don't need to go into that argument. That's for another time, but it is interesting that there's a little bit of difference there. Bentham, however, thinks that the principle of utility is self-evident or seemingly so. So he claims that humans by nature generally embrace this principle of utility and of course they act accordingly. And he says, when people criticize utilitarianism, those who argue against the principle, what they are doing, they're doing so by actually using the principle. So for Bentham, the examples he said that he's heard uh, that are supposedly showing utilitarianism has a problem or is untenable as a moral theory, they actually are using principles of utility in order to make their case. So there may be cases where the principle is misapplied, he says, but that does not mean it is a wrong principle. So the principles of utilitarianism, as we said, can apply for individuals and communities. And of course, communities are composed of individual. So we can focus on the individual. That's perfectly uh, good and right to do so. But if you are in a position of making public policy, you need to use the principles of utilitarianism. So what is it? Let's, let's get into more of the detail here. Uh, how do you measure the value of pleasure? And Bentham does think that you can measure this. One thing that you need to consider is the intensity. 
how good something feels or how bad something feels. So for example, if you go to a physician or if you see a nurse, they will ask you to rate your pain on the scale of one to 10. One is just very, very mild discomfort that you can ignore and 10 be excruciating pain uh, that is making you uh, absolutely terrified and miserable because of it. Well, the idea is what you could do the same thing for pleasure. You could put that on a scale of one to 10. And that will be useful in a, in a moment when we talk about measuring this and putting these other factors together. Another way you measure the value of pleasure is the duration. How long does it last? So some pleasures only last moments or maybe minutes. Some pleasures last a lot longer. And you can just measure this in time, right? Minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years. Another thing that we should measure when we are considering pleasure, and again, it applies to pain as well, is the certainty or uncertainty that an action has to produce its expected consequences. So um, if you are extremely thirsty and you get a cold glass of water to drink, there's some pretty high certainty that this is going to relieve your thirst and give you pleasure. If you are considering a large purchase, like in a car or a, a house or something, your degree of certainty on whether this will give you the long-term pleasure that you expect is lower. Uh, people have buyer's remorse, problems come up in, the, in these kinds of things. So that would be something that has less certainty. And finally, then a, as a direct measure of pleasure, we can talk about its propinquity, and that is how near it is in time. And, and roughly speaking, the nearness in time is better, right? It's better to have the enjoyment now than to delay it until later. Keeping in mind, of course, that we're talking about the duration as well. Often when something's near in time, it gives you a short period of pleasure, but a long period of pain or downside. And so that has to be kept in mind here. All things being equal, the first three things being equal, things that are more near in time are preferred to things that are not. Okay, so these four aspects are directly related to pleasure and of course pain themselves. But there are other things Bentham describes that are important to consider. Other things in, to take into consideration when you are evaluating the mora morality of an action. So one of those is fecundity. Fecundity is the tendency to produce the recurrence of the experience. So some pleasures are likely to give us more pleasure in the future. I am confident that Mill and Bentham would talk about studying philosophy is something that does this. You can enjoy it now and it helps you enjoy studying philosophy later. The more you understand, the more you can appreciate as you continue to study it. The other aspect is purity. Does, is there a tendency to cause the opposite, making it impure? So purity is something that if it causes pleasure, it's unlikely to cause pain. But a lot of things that we experience, there's this saying, a moment on the lips, a lifetime on the hips, right? The idea that it's momentary pleasure, but long-term pain. So uh, what, when I was using that phrase, it's tenderly, tended to be used toward things like ice cream or cake, you know, things that give you immediate pleasure, but aren't healthy for you. And if, of course, you overindulge, they can cause health problems. So those would lack purity. Um, again, something like studying would be more pure. And then finally, there is one other thing that's needed to be considered. Although we have called utilitarianism hedonism,
It is very important to keep in mind that Bentham says that the number of people is also relevant. This is not about making oneself happy. This is not an egoist theory. It is not saying you just worry about your own pleasure. It is saying, of course, you have to take into account how other people are going to be affected. Now, this, of course, is not a direct measure of pleasure, but it is an extremely important thing to consider when you are measuring the utility of an action. You have to think about how your action is going to affect others. So given all this, you can calculate morality. It is something that you can think through and calculate. Now, Bentham describes, and he uses this phrase, summing up the values in order to determine what produces the most utility. I might say, suggest that if you're really going to uh, use numbers here, and, and you can, right? You put the intensity on the scale of one to 10, you measure the duration with time, the certainty you could put on a, a scale between zero and one, a probability scale, the propen propinquity and the fecundity, um, the purity, all of these things you could put on scales. And of course, the extent you could count the number of people affected. And I would suggest that you would multiply these things, not merely sum them up, because if you're just summing them up, you don't quite give enough credence to some of the aspects of pleasure that ought to be considered. So while he doesn't use this terminology, and uh, uh, while the Brits were very good at developing accounting techniques, uh, they certainly wouldn't have access to spreadsheets in the sense that we use them and know them on computers, but having a spreadsheet certainly seems to be consistent in the kind of thing that Bentham had in mind. He would approve of the idea of creating a spreadsheet that factors in all seven things in order to determine the value of an action. And as I suggested, maybe you multiply these things. And so you just punch in your numbers and it gives you a result, a value. And when you do that, then you can compare the pleasure factor with the pain factor. And this is going to tell you then, so you do it once for the pleasure and once for the pain. And if the balance is on the side of pain, well, the action promotes evil. It's an immoral action. But if the balance is on the side of pleasure, then the action promotes the good. And so this can give you a very practical method of determining what is morally right and what is morally wrong. So we have this practical application now. So if you're in a position where you are considering more than one option to take, say um, how to spend your day, you have time or how to spend your money, you have money, other resources, how, what you should do with these resources that we have. And if you're considering more than one option, then you just calculate the utility for each of the options that you are considering and then you can make a moral decision based on those calculations. Now, you can't expect to perform the prof process of calculation every time you're making any decision. So Bentham is fully aware of that, but it can serve as a general guide to action. And of course, the more often you do this, the more often you don't need to do it because you already have calculated things previously. And so, if you do the calculation once for a decision and it gives you an answer, you don't have to go through that process again. And so when you in, are in the similar situation in the future, you already know uh, what the right thing to do is and you don't have to calculate it all the time. So this way of approaching things is consistent with human nature, argues Bentham, and it's widely applicable. It can apply to all kinds of concerns that we have in any kind of activity that we get into. Now, there is one other aspect I want to add. Bentham said, although we've been talking about humans, of course, and in our principles of utility and calculating values, we've been focusing in on humans. 
Bentham says it actually does make sense to consider animals pleasure and pain. So the issue here, why should we do this? Well, it's not whether an animal can reason or talk. It's not whether an animal itself makes moral decisions, but can animals suffer is the question we need to ask. Can they experience pleasure? And obviously that's a rhetorical question. And in, if animals can suffer, we need to include that in our calculation of utility. If animals can experience pleasure, then we need to include those ideas in the calculation of our utility when making moral decisions. So it is relevant to do so. Now, that doesn't get you just as a, a one practical outcome that one might presume here. It doesn't get you directly to vegetarianism, okay? It doesn't get you directly to the non-use of animal products, all right? Now, partly, maybe even mostly, because animals have little or no capacity for anticipation of pain. So it's not like if, and we're not talking about factory farms here, let's, let's put our context in a pastoral setting, all right? I know uh, that much of the meat produced, for example, in the United States might come from factory farms, but there are still cattle and chickens raised in an open area, open range uh, facility. And those chickens, those cattle, they're not worrying about one day being slaughtered to be, be eaten. And so Bentham says, we can take that into consideration. So some of these animals might be happy happier overall if fed well, you know, raised well, slaughtered quickly when it's time, than if you just leave them to die naturally, which typically is not going to be a good death for an animal. Starvation, uh, predation, um, other kinds of things like that are not as, uh, it produces, I should say, more pain than a, a quick slaughter of the animal would. And so I'm, I'm not trying to defend uh, being an omnivore here either. Uh, we just are recognizing that Bentham says we can take the principles of utility and we can use them and to consider animals as well. Some of the aspects are not going to apply uh, as directly uh, when we're thinking about animals, and uh, but they need to be considered. Now, in terms of criticisms of Bentham, for now I'm not creating a video with criticisms of Bentham, but the criticisms of John Stuart Mill's version of utilitarianism will for the most part apply to the criticisms of Bentham. So if you're interested in that, you can check out that video.